The next part of my tagging series is how to read patterns. Here are two very common ways uh, that people write down tatting patterns. One is more of a shorthand pictorial way and one is an abbreviation way much like um, crocheting. Tatting hasn't changed much over the last 200 to 250 years, so any patterns that you find in the 1800s or the 1900s can easily be recreated today. A lot of the pattern books in print now are actually reprints from 100 plus years ago, so they would work just fine in any kind of historical reproductions or any kind of historical clothing. As with any lace making or sewing techniques, how these patterns are written down and what words they use to describe stitches changes from place to place and from time to time. AntiquePatternLibrary.org is a great resource for old patterns. They have collected and scanned a ton of lace making books on bobbin lace and needle lace and crochet that were out of copyright and scanned them so that they're available for everyone. It's an amazing resource. The Gutenberg Library is another one that's really great if you know the title of the book you're looking for. Sometimes technique search words don't come up with much. Of course, another great resource is the Encyclopedia of Needlework. You can find this in antique books, in reprints, you can find it in iBooks, both paid and free. There may be a Kindle edition. I also know that they've just published it on a website called encyclopediaofneedlework.com, I think. And I'll put all these links in the description. So there is actually a lot of online access to tatting patterns. I also want to preface this video by saying that it is quite a bit into my series on tatting. So I am going to assume at this point that you can make a ring with stitches that have properly flipped and so they slide very nicely, know how to make a chain, know how to work with a shuttle, know how to work with a shuttle and a ball, know how to make picos, know how to join rings. If you don't know how to do that yet, I would suggest going back into the series and finding the videos where I cover those. I have a video on the basic tatting knot and how to make it slide correctly. I have a video on picos. I have a video on using a ball in a shuttle versus just a shuttle. So with that being said, let's carry on. The first thing I wanna say about trying to decipher patterns, whether it's a, like a drawn out shorthand pictorial version or the more spelled out or abbreviated but still using letters um, wordy version. Look at the introduction. Introductions are the most underrated part of any book because the introduction is going to basically let you into the author's mind for a second. You're going to find out where they're coming from, what they're trying to get across with their book. Are they going to be more theoretical? Are they going to be just basically patterns? And also, if they are patterns, how to read their pattern. Not everyone uses the same abbreviations. Not everyone uses the same stitch names. There's lots of different ways to come up with the exact same product, but using entirely different vocabulary. So look at the introduction and it will tell you, the, here it is and the very first thing is symbols used in patterns. So this book we know right away is not going to spell them out, not going to use any kind of abbreviations. She's going to draw her patterns. Um, let's see if I can find some. She's going to draw her patterns like this. So her key is that a circle equals a ring, a dotted thread between them equals a single thread without the chain. Solid means a chain. Each one of these little hash marks is going to be a decorative pico. The filled in loopy looking ones are going to be joined picos. The numbers in between the picos are going to be the number of stitches between. And then this little 12p times 2 is a ring with 12 picos, each separated by two stitches. So these, this is a very universal way to write out to write out your patterns without actually using a vocabulary and using it all pictures instead. So this is a really great book to use, especially if you're a beginner. She writes down her patterns in this very pictorial way. This is a very common way. It's a great shorthand way if you're working on a pattern of your own design 
and you want to kind of keep notes as you go, um, like maybe you want to add more stitches here or add an extra pico here, it's a great shorthand way to just kind of keep track of what you're doing. It's also a very easy way for more visual learners to be able to just say, oh, there's the pattern and here's what I'm making. Just a note from my own procedures, when I'm working a pattern out of a book, I do like to make a sample and leave it in there. I probably made this 20 years ago and you just kind of throw it in there and it just gives you a little extra, oh, I have tried this, this is what it looks like, this is how it feels in this specific type of thread, all that kind of thing. So this is what it looks like. You just want to draw out the bit, very basic shape. The alphabet corresponds to the order that you're going to create them in. So A, B, and then C is this line of chains. D, E are these two rings. And then F is that series of chains and G, H is these two loops. So you know your order of operations. You've got loops, chain, loops, upper chain, loops, lower chain, loops, upper chain. The slash marks are where the picos are. Funny, her pattern doesn't match the picture. There should be three picos and there's two picos. And then the numbers correspond to how many whole stitches or double stitches are in between each pico. So you have four, 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 four. So this is a very simple pattern. Everything is fours. You've got four between each pico, then you've got four between the picos and the chain, four between each pico and the ring, and four between each pico and the chain. This one down here looks like it's all multiples of three. You've got three for each ring and then three between each pico in the chain, and then the ring. So you would do this ring, then you would do this series of chains, then you would do this ring, then this series of chains, then this ring, this series of chains, and that ring, and carry on. So that's a really easy way to read these patterns without having to do any kind of decoding or figuring out what other people's terms for things are. They might call it a double stitch and you're used to a whole stitch. They might call it a Josephine knot instead of a half stitch ring. With any handiwork, especially old ones, regions and time periods call things entirely different things. And you might get really confused because you've never heard a certain term before when really you've been doing it the whole time just with a different term. So this kind of gets away from it all. There's no language involved. There's no abbreviations involved. There aren't any names involved. It's just purely pictures and numbers. All right, so let's do a fairly easy one here out of this book. Using this technique, we've got one, two, three picots with three double stitches, double stitches or whole stitches or whatever in between them. So. One, two, three, and a pico. Now, I've just practiced making picos the same size. It's a lot easier than having yet another tool in your hand. If you would like to have very even picos without all the practice, you can use a gauge. What you'll find in really old books is using a pin. Now, this is kind of an evil pin. If I was going to use this for gauging picos a lot, I would probably just take one and make it my dedicated pico pin and file this down so it wasn't quite so evil. Okay, so you have your pin, you hold it on your work like this. Now you're just gonna grab your thread and wrap it around. And that thread is going to be how big your pico is. Often in very, very old patterns, they'll say take a gauge two pin and make three loops around it for this pico and make one loop around it for the next pico. And that will change how much thread you've put in between these stitches to make your pico. So for this, we'll just use one. So we've got one. and then make your stitch. And then you can see when you pull it out,
that you have a Pico. And it's going to be the same size as the next one because that's exactly how much thread you're using is one time around that pin. All right, so we have three Pico. One, there's two stitches, there's three stitches. All right, so we're going to make our next Pico. So let's hold our pin there or not. Loop it around. three. We'll need one more Pico. So let's loop it around. Okay, so we should have four groups of three and a total of three Picos. So we have one, two, three, four, and one, two, three Picos. Pull your pin out and close your ring. Okay, so then it's saying that they do want you to use a chain because that's the section that we're in. So I have a ball of thread there for a chain. Remember when you're adding a chain, you always turn it upside down to make your chains. And how many are we gonna make? So we're gonna make letter B, and that's gonna be three double stitches or whole stitches, a Pico, and then another three double stitches or whole stitches. One. Oh, no. Two, three, and then for the sake of practice, got our pin. One. That didn't work out. Two. Three. Now we've got our ring, A. We've got our chain, which is B. Then we'll make another ring, just like A for C, and we'll carry on. So we'll make one more ring, and then we will move on to the next way of reading a pattern. All right, so. One. Two, three, now we're gonna join our picos. Okay, so that's that join right there. Now we're going to make this decorative pico. two, three, and then we'll have to make this Pico that will join with the next ring. Loop around. Just one. Two. Three. 
All right. So we have our join and we have our two picos. There's our join and our two picos. Take out your pin. So I think that's enough to get the general idea. You can see we made four groups of three double stitches. One, two, three, four. We made three picots, one, two, three, and then we made our chain. We went from A to B. We made a series of chains, three double stitches, a picot, and three double stitches, three, three with a picot. Then we move from B to C, make this ring, attach it to the previous one there, make the ring for the next one there. So we did three, 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 three just like that one. So there's three, pico, three, pico, three, pico, three, and close, just like here. And there's your pattern. The next way is very similar to crocheting if you have a crocheting background. With that, you'll see double crochet, single crochet, all abbreviated down to initials. So it'll say like three DC, one SC for three double crochets, one single crochet. And this is very similar to that. This, like I've said before, is one of, I think, the best needlework guides ever made. My mom had a copy of this. I learned from it. It's been reprinted a number of times. I think it's just really is one of the best compilations of needlework. It has everything from, you know, uh, basic stitching, plain sewing, to bobbin lace, knitting, macrame, crochet, absolutely everything. A little bit of pillow lace. This is one of my, um, yeah, I have all of these made. Um, okay, so let's see. Anyway, this is a tatting video, so we need to find tatting. And I'll have little instructions on how to do it and then some more basic patterns. It has everything spelled out. So this figure 529 scallops with picots, this right here, figure 529 scallops with picots, it says tat four stitches, meaning like whole stitches or double stitches, both sides, one pico, and then there's an asterisk, three stitches, one pico, two stitches, one pico, two stitches, one pico, three stitches, one pico, four stitches, and close the ring. So that's fairly straightforward. Leave sufficient length of thread before beginning the next ring, for the rings not to overlap each other. So see how there's a little a thread gap there so they can be straight. If you don't have enough, your thread will curve, which may actually be something you want if you're trying to make an edging for a circle. Or if you put too much string, it will curve inside. It will curve with the rings inside and that you may want as an insert lace for the inside of a circle or the inside of a collar or something like that. All right, so in the revised edition, this is figure five, six, eight. In the original edition, it's 529. So we've read 529. Let's find 568 here. Figure 568 right next to it. Okay. With one shuttle, make four DSTS. In this one, it says a note on abbreviations. From here on, we shall use the abbreviation D for double, ST for stitch, and STS for stitches. So when we're down here in this pattern that we've been looking at, number 568, says with one shuttle, make four DSTS. So we know that that's double stitches. Three double stitches, one pico, four double stitches, close the ring. Before beginning the next ring, leave a length of thread sufficiently long enough to prevent the rings from overlapping. It's the same thing up here, just worded slightly differently. Make four double stitches, basically in the next ring, make four double stitches, draw the left hand thread through the fifth pico of the preceding ring and repeat from the asterisk. So most of the directions are exactly the same, but I just wanted to show you, even with reprints of the exact same work, sometimes they're spelled out completely. And sometimes you'll find this DSTS type abbreviation, which is very similar to crochet, just depending on how the author wants to present his or her work. So I suppose because we made the last one, we should make this one too. So this is just a single shuttle. We don't need the ball of thread. And it says with one shuttle, make four double stitches. We can do that. So 
so there's one, two, three, four, okay, four double stitches, one pico, three double stitches. So where's our pin? Here's our little pico pin. Ish. There. One. Oops. Two. Three. Three double stitches. Another pico. One. So two double stitches, one pico. I'm trying not to stab myself with this pin and it's making my stitches all very ungraceful. All right, so then there's two double stitches and another pico. We have three double stitches, another pico, and then four double stitches. four and then close the ring. Okay, so then it says before the beginning of the next ring, leave a length of thread sufficiently long enough. So let's leave a little bit of thread and then make four stitches with the next one. Two. Four. Draw the left hand thread through the fifth pico of the preceding ring and repeat. So we're going to reach in, basically saying just join them, reach in, draw up the thread. Okay. And then repeat from the asterisk. Where's the asterisk? So three double stitches. There's three, and then a pico and two double stitches. Two, uh, pico, two double stitches, pico, two double stitches. Two. Okay, and then three double stitches. One, two, three, another pico, four. There's our little pico. One, two, three, four. And close the ring. So with him, you can see we made four double stitches right there, one pico right there. Then that's the part that's only specific to the first ring. After that, we're just going to keep following that asterisk. So then three double stitches, a pico, two double stitches, a pico, two double stitches, pico, three double stitches, pico, and four double stitches, pico. 
close the ring for the next ring leave the length of thread so we did that um, make four double stitches to start the next one draw the left hand thread the long way of saying join the two rings and repeat from the asterisk three double stitches a pico two pico two pico three pico four close it leave some thread and go on so once you realize that this is the 4D STS, really just means, where'd it go? D for double, ST for stitch, STS for stitches. That's going to be a very common way to abbreviate a tatting pattern if they don't want to actually just write it all out or if they're not doing the shorthand version with the picture. So these are the three most common ways of finding tatting patterns. You're going to have a shorthand version, which is very pictorial with the numbers, the letters of order of operations. So it, it's a very visual way of doing it. You'll have them spelled out completely with every single word and you'll have abbreviations. Don't get confused by the abbreviations. Just make sure you look for the key. Okay, so hopefully that helped a little bit and uh, you're able to carry on with patterns that you can find online or in books and keep tatting. So until next time, thanks for watching. Bye. A forward and a backward, the two halves. And then the alphabet is what I have no idea how disruptive that is. Hey. Damon's got it. You want to go play with Damon? Yeah, Damon.